Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson Jr. Today, Pastor Pearson's message is entitled Surprises and Disappointments. Tonight we're going to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. We'll take just a little tiny beginning of the sermon, and then we'll go to, uh, well, I'm giving you advance notice. We're going to 2 Kings chapter 5 after that. So if you need a little time to find 2 Kings chapter 5, you might want to skip the Luke, but uh, that's where we'll be afterwards. So we're in Luke chapter 4, and... Let's look at verse 27. Here's what the Bible says. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. We've entitled our study for tonight, Surprises and Disappointments. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the things that you are accomplishing in your name. We're grateful for Jesus and what he does in our presence to give us courage to build our faith. Now tonight, once again, I dare not go forward until I have the assurance that you are here with us. You have said that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be in the midst of them. So all around the globe, wherever the downlink sites are tonight, Father, be there with everyone. And I pray that because of it, we shall experience the power in Jesus' name. Amen. This, uh, this is a marvelous story. If, if I get carried away, and sometimes I do, I, I hope you'll forgive me. There are people from different cultures who respond to the Word of God in different ways. Some people are very quiet. I have nothing against you. In fact, my rule is very simple. You don't tell me how to preach, I won't tell you how to respond. <laughs> but uh, I promise you, this one gets me excited. You recognize that uh, this gentleman is most often referred to as Naaman. There's a little dip in that name that I've had to put. I am from the state of Alabama. My tongue does not automatically speak in the cadence that's known in the Middle East. So if I revert to Naaman, you won't be mad at me, will you? It's a cultural thing. But Naaman is... A mighty man of valor. He's a military strategist. Uh, through him, God has given some amazing talents. Now, somebody will say God was not on the side of the Syrians. God, you can't say that God blessed Naaman when he was against the people of God. And, and there are those who think that if you're not on my side, you're not on God's side. I believe God gives blessings to people on every side of every equation. And I believe that every talent, every skill comes from the hand of God. You decide how you use it. So allow me, if you will, to believe that even Naaman, while he was on the wrong side to us, still had to get his skills from God. He had won many victories. He understood how to uh, go in skillfully, perhaps use the phalanx and surround the enemy so that before they even knew what was happening, he was upon them. And the king of Syria, Benadad, had great pride in Naaman. So that when you begin to talk about how powerful was the country of Syria, then Benadad would say, it's all due to Naaman. And there would be people who would join in and say, yes, it's Naaman. I believe that if little children were around and saw him coming, particularly the boys, you know, they get carried away with that kind of thing. So forgive me if I think that when they saw him coming, they would say, hey, 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 look. There he is. Who? Naaman. Coming in his cherry. Have you ever see a cherry like that? <laughs> yeah, look at him. And you know something, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like Naaman. He was a man of valor. 
He was a man of power. When you get power, money usually follows it. So I would suggest to you that when he showed up, he wore clothing that betokened his place in life. That's usually how it goes. There was, however, a chink in Naaman's armor. With all of the power that he had, he also had a disease that was an awful distraction to who he was. He was a leper. Now, I, I could describe it in fairly good detail. I think I can make some of you even get a little nauseous because I've studied what it looked like. I know the coloration of the skin and how the colors changed. I know that the, uh, that, that the hair that was normally on the body would also change color. I, I could explain things in, in detail that would be a little hard to stand. So let's just say that leprosy was not anything you wanted to have. It might be equivalent to some of the diseases we know now that carry a social stigma with them. And so even though the young people, the boys might have been excited about what he was and what he had done, when they thought about getting close to him, somebody had to say, yeah, but don't get close to him. Why not? He got leprosy. And you know, they don't know how that thing smooth moves. It might, you might get it. It might so you didn't know how quite to take him. Here was a man with all of this power, and yet he has this problem that detracts from who he is. If anybody had the resources to be healed, it was Naaman. I, I, I have no question in my mind that he went to the best physicians that Syria had. When you got money, you can get the best medical care. You can travel anywhere. You can go where the doctors are, or you can pay to fly them in to you. If you don't have resources, it's difficult. But this man commanded everything that he needed. So I have no doubt that he had tried every physician. Then after you run out of the physicians, you, uh, well, today you would get on late night television and watch infomercials. And they got a lot of them that tell you how to cure practically anything you're not sure whether it's true or not they say that if you use this pill or this powder or if you get into this regimen but but maybe he had even tried things not on television of course but somebody would come and say uh, uh, Nahum I've heard of, of, of a cure and you ought to try that perhaps even those spoke with those old wives tales you know have you ever heard some of those you better be careful with them some of them may be true, but others will have you doing things that you know that you ought not do. Even when you begin to start with them, a bell ought to ring in the back of your head and tell you, you have gone too far. But if you are weary of your illness, you will try practically anything to get rid of it. So in this house, there was a theme that was there. And the theme could not be ignored because the man of the house with all of his power, every time he moved, you looked at him and saw spots on his skin. And you recognize that as he moved, he may have a twisted joint. And somebody would say, that's so sad. Naaman is a leper. Well, in one of the raids that the Syrians would often uh, conduct, someone went into Israel. And this is a very sad story. They snatched from her home a little girl, took her from her family, brought her into Syria, and she must have been precocious in some kind of way because she ends up in the house of Naaman. If she were lazy, she would have never gotten there. Out of pause to punctuate that. I know people right now who are praying for wonderful things to happen in their lives, and I would suggest to you that God feeds the birds, but he does not throw worms in their nest. If you want a job, you ought to go where jobs are. On a Monday morning, you should not be in your bed still asleep, thinking that somebody's going to knock on your door and say, hey, 
I heard you were looking for a job. That's not the way it happens. God will answer your prayers, but you ought to be in the vicinity of answers. So if you're asking for a job, be where jobs are. In fact, uh, you've got to show some initiative. God does not reward people who only pray. Until you have prayed, there is nothing more important that you can do except pray. But when you have prayed, you ought to begin to move at the dictates of God because God rewards those who knock, who seek, those who are moving in the direction that he directs. This little girl must have been quite somebody because they said, look, you are perfect. We're going to send you to a nice house. I know you don't like being here, but since you've got to be here anyway, we're going to send you to the house of Lord Naomi. And when you get there, you'll discover that you'll be surrounded by wealth and luxury. Now, reality check. You take me from my home. Hmm? Take me from my country. Take me from my family. And then you think I'm going to get excited about going to some soldier's house? I'm so glad that I was not in the spot where this little girl is. Because I don't know if I would have been so quick to move at God's commands. I think I would have had a moment where I'd, been, I'd have been too bitter to respond. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If they put me in that house, I might have thought at least once or twice, I wish his hand would drop off. <laughs> Bring me over here. I mean, a slave in his house. I wish his leg would fall off and he'd go sideways and sink somewhere. But when he came by, I would know that I needed to say, Hello there, Lord Naaman. How are you this morning? But you know something? The power of Jesus can keep you from becoming bitter in the worst of circumstances. Pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. Nobody has to be miserable. In fact, you can tell me all about your situation tonight, and I'm sure if we gave everybody an opportunity, we'd talk each other down to the dregs, we'd chase each other to some river and jump in corporately. But the fact is that you may be surrounded by negative situations, but you don't have to get bathed in negativity. You don't have to turn bitter just because your situation is bitter. In fact, I posit to you that Jesus is so powerful that he can find you in a terrible situation and his love can pipe into your mind and into your heart until you are different than where you are. Anybody can be miserable in the midst of misery. It takes somebody who knows Jesus to be different than your surroundings. And I suggest to you that you ought not languish where you are. In fact, there's somebody here tonight who could tell us, I, I don't even want to go home. I tell you what, pick up a little Jesus before you go home. Take him home with you. In fact, let him go home before you. Let him get there before you arrive. And I promise you that even if Jesus does not change your situation, he will change you so much that you react to your situation differently. Do you see it? That's the power of Jesus. So this little girl is not quite like I am, I admit it. One day it comes to her that maybe no doctor in Syria can heal Naaman. But she remembers that there was a prophet, a prophet in her homeland who had power beyond physicians. Well, that's, that's some information that I might have kept. Because I'm being honest with you, here I am in a foreign land, in a foreign house, and I've got to do what they say. But this young lady was so moved by the power of Jesus that she suggests to somebody you know, if he really wants to be healed, I know a man. You know, a preacher ought not ever say things like that because I'm tempted to take off on I know a man, but we'll do that later on. Just wanted to let you know I, I recognized it when I passed. I, I know somebody 
and she says to maybe the wife maybe one of the other servants if he really wants to be healed there's a man in Israel who moves by power that is greater than he is and somebody began well you know how it is whispering at the office where you work don't they do it bad news moves very quickly good news moves eventually <laughs> and somebody will say hey, did anybody tell him the little girl you know the little girl nice little girl she didn't get mad I'm shocked because if I were that little girl I'd be crying all day long but she's got something in her that just keeps her kind of bouncing around and even though she's away from her family and her parents she still has a power in her that keeps her from turning bitter and incidentally little girl says she knows somebody who could heal Lord Naaman of his leprosy I said well somebody go tell him I said well I'm scared to tell him because if it doesn't work he might think I failed so why don't you tell him oh, well, well let her tell him oh she'll do it <laughs> maybe she got the opportunity uh, excuse me uh, Lord Naaman, I know it's not natural for me to, to like you. And I, you know, and I do want to say that I would rather be at home. But since I'm here, I want you to know that there's a man in my home country who moves by the power of my God. And this man could heal you of your leprosy. Now, the, the title of the sermon is Surprises and Disappointments. I'm going to take you through some surprises first. My first surprise is that the little girl didn't turn bitter. My second surprise is that a man so powerful in Syria would listen to a prescription from somebody who is of another nation. Do you see it? I know people who claim to be Christians, but they will only like you if you are like them. This is not the point to be quiet. You revealed something about yourself. <laughs> there are people who claim that they are children of God, that they are in the family of God. And when you say that you are in the family of God, you must understand that in Christ, we are all one. Ah. I might not naturally gravitate towards you. I, I might not immediately think you're the greatest person I ever met. But if I discover that, that Jesus made you, that Jesus saved you, if, if I notice in you nothing that draws me to you naturally, but I recognize that you belong to him, you are family. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? You're going to ask for a different neighborhood? <laughs> you, you think they got zoning regulations in heaven? All you folk go that way? All of you go that way? Hey, I got a funny feeling. We're going to all be together there. So maybe you ought to stop trying to go to heaven if you can't stand people who are not just like you. Because in Christ... We are one. So I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised, that Naaman says, bring her in here. Let me listen to her. But, you know, if, if you got a problem, you can drop all of that stuff about national origin. <laughs> when you really need help, national origin does not appear on your radar. So the first surprise is that he accepts it from this dear one. Now, the second one is, that when Naaman decides that he wants to act on it, and don't let me pass by too quickly, that the faith of a little girl engenders faith in an old soldier, which engenders faith in the king of Syria. Faith spreads. Faith is contagious. If you've got faith, you ought to share faith. You ought to let it out and don't be equivocating when you do it. Say it and mean it. Stand on it. Don't back down. Let it be your story and stick to it. If you know what God can do, don't keep it to yourself. 
Little girl says, I believe. Naaman says, okay then, I believe. Gets in contact with the king, he says, all right then, I'll believe. Faith is contagious. Now, Naaman says, look, write, write the letters. I want to do this right. Send the letters to the king of Israel and, and let him know that I want to come over and find this prophet. I want, to, I want to find this one who might be able to, in a super normal way, handle my disease. Now, amazingly, this, this, this is interesting to me. The king of Syria catches faith. The king of Israel, who ought to have faith, uh, hey, just because you got your membership at some church does not make you holy. <laughs> just because your grandmother was a Christian, it doesn't pass down the genetic structure. Just because you are identified with a group of people who ought to be faithful does not mean you have faith. Faith is an individual thing that comes through the power of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And you got to get it yourself. You can't depend on it spreading to you. It spreads, but you ought to get it for yourself through the power of Jesus Christ. So the, the king of Israel says, oh, see, see, see what's happening, gentlemen. Wake up. Benadad is trying to create some international incident so he can have a pretext for war. Well, the word got over to, uh, to the prophet. And uh, what you've got to understand is, though the king didn't have faith, prophet said, hey, what, what's the situation? Well, there's, there's a, a great soldier in Syria who wants to come here so you can heal him. And our king says he doesn't want it to happen because it might cause an international incident. Prophet said, bring the man. Bring him in here. We don't, have any, we don't need any international incidents. The power of God is able to work on Israelites as well as Syrians. God can heal anybody who believes. Do you believe it? There are no national boundaries. Think God won't work on somebody because they come from some different nation? So, listen, you must understand that, that the prophet seized on it. The king saw it as a challenge. The prophet saw it as an opportunity. Put me in the category with the prophet. When a problem arises, it's not a challenge. With God, it's an opportunity. In fact, when you have a test, you ought to get excited because you know God is able. So if God is able, the only thing you need to find out is how he's going to do what he can do because he has the power. And so I'm telling you that we've got a moment here where the prophet is on the right side. Now, the second thing that surprises me, incidentally, is that Naaman, though he is powerful, does not run off on his own. I'm going to say this so carefully. There are Christians who love Jesus, but they can't get along with other Christians. Because everything they do is unilateral. You know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm in Christ. <laughs> well, why don't you check with the superintendent? I don't have to check with the superintendent. I got Jesus in me just like she's got Jesus in her. I don't have to ask anybody. I move on my own. And that's why in many religious groups you can barely keep them together. They are like mercury. You can't hold them together because there are not enough people who have Jesus in their lives who recognize that Jesus has placed people in authority. And so long as it doesn't conflict with thus saith the Lord, you ought to recognize people in authority. So watch this. The word comes. And, and my third surprise is that a powerful man like Naaman wouldn't say, uh, someone go and pick up Elisha. Take my chariot. No, not the best one. <laughs> yeah. 
you're going to Israel. I understand their roads are not particularly in great repair. Take, uh, take Air Force Two. <laughs> and, and go pick him up. Bring him here. And, you know, give him every respect. But I need healing. Bring him. But look, if you really need healing from God, why does the healing have to come to you? So I'm surprised. I am pleasantly surprised that here's a powerful person that doesn't try to bring everything to him. He's not like those people on the internet who order everything and expect it in a few hours. Overnight express. When you want something from Jesus, why don't you go where Jesus is? Why don't you go and seek him? Why don't you do that? Naaman surprises me because he doesn't try to control the situation. Naaman surprises me because after he gets there, and you forgive me, I, I see this stuff. I feel like I've been there. So I, I see the, the preparations that are made, the, the, the silver that they put together. One biblical scholar said it was at least $50,000 worth of silver that they put together. I don't know what that'd be worth now, but they put together a purse for the prophet and they get into the chariot and they make sure everything is right. I can see it happening. You don't travel alone if you are a great celebrated general. You have hangers on. You have mid-management functionaries. So if you're riding, if you're riding in your Hummer, You've got a few Chevy Suburbans up front and a few Chevy Suburbans in back. Forgive me, my imagination works this way. Join us next time for more of Pastor Pearson's message entitled, Surprises and Disappointments. The Breath of Life television ministry proudly presents a special gift offer this week, The Desire of Ages. The life story of the greatest spiritual leader the world has ever known, Jesus Christ. Desire of Ages goes in depth into events surrounding the life of Jesus, giving you more meaning and a clearer picture of his impact on the world and those who choose to follow him even to this day. In these uncertain times, Desire of Ages gives direction for all who seek it. The book answers hard questions confronting us all. It examines basic spiritual truths, gives hope and encouragement for tomorrow, and brings you face to face with the Savior. Just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. And ask for your copy of Desire of Ages. The book is yours for a gift of $5 or more. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The Desire of Ages. It's the greatest story ever told in a whole new light.